because happiness is not an effect of external stimuli. It is an effect of an internal being. And the internal state that we are in is completely dependent on our actions, on our behavior. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Live from New York, it's Spiritually Hungry, episode 83. Yes. So, it's super great just to be together in a room um, with some sense of normalcy again on this powerful night, which is also the new moon of Pisces, take two. Take two. So, we are going to talk about how to live happier tonight. In eighth grade, my teacher said to me, or she asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up. I wrote down happy. And she told me I didn't understand the assignment. Now older, I wish I told her she didn't understand the answer. (laughs) Even the Declaration of Independence lays out our inalienable right to pursuit of happiness, and we haven't stopped looking for it. Throughout life, as a child, as a teenager, as an adult, when we're even older, we are in that pursuit of what makes us happy, how can we thrive, and how can we be happy every day? It's not those moments of happiness, because we have those, right? We have those milestone moments, weddings, birthdays, but how do we sustain happiness every day of our lives? So a few facts for where we are now. The National Opinion Research Center conducted a 2020 study, and the news isn't that happy. In fact, in 2020, only 14% of adult Americans reported that they were very happy, down from 31% in 2018. I don't think that's surprising. It's sad. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously, the pandemic has impacted those numbers a lot. So I want to ask you, and I have my own answer for this. You or or them? You. Me? Okay. You know, I'd like to ask you. So before I give my answer, why do you think people aren't happy? Oh, Oh, that's a big question. (laughs) It is a big question. It would take me a long time to answer. (laughs) But uh, before that, I'll I'll, I'll first say something. When we were in London, we had the opportunity to um, share this with a small group of our students, that one of my favorite um, quotes to disagree with is a relatively famous quote by Freud, who, those of you who know, there's a concept that he developed called the pleasure principle. And that is, which I think we all understand to be true, but that scientifically as well, you can take all human activity, everything, from work to play to everything that we do is only one purpose, really one that is divided into two. One is that we are naturally desiring of pleasure, and we are desiring to limit those things that cause us pain. He calls it the the, the pleasure principle. But the crazy, that, that of course we agree with, because Kabbalistically as well, the singular purpose for creation and the singular purpose for which all of us are in this world is only one thing, to be happy, to achieve what we call goodness, happiness. The second thing Freud says, which I strongly disagree with, is that if you look at the world, if you look at creation, one must say that the pleasure principle or the concept that people should be happy was not part of the plan of creation. Because, and it's true, if you look at the world as exactly to the point that you just said, and it's, I'm sure, unfortunately, many of us probably feel that at times, only 12% of, was that Americans or the world population? That was Americans. Americans. And I'm sure it's true in the rest of the world. So it's a really strange paradox, right? On the one hand, it is so clear to all of us that the only, the only pursuit that we really have, whether it's, again, behind everything that we do, success, money, marriage, it's for one reason to be able to become happier. On the other hand, you look at the world well, and it's... Well, for some it's a little more complicated, but yes. Right, but it's at the core, it's at the core. And it doesn't seem to be working. And that's why Freud came to the conclusion that the world must be working against that pleasure principle. So to answer your question now, why <laughs> is it? Why is it that that only 12% of Americans and probably a very small percentage... 14. 14, sorry. <laughs> of, of 14% of Americans and... of I'm sure uh, uh, approximately the same amount of worldwide uh, population are not happy, are happy meaning the rest are unhappy, is because at the core, our ability to be happy 
is dependent on who we are. And I'll explain that a little bit. Spiritually, how we behave affects the state, we'll call it consciousness, mind, our demeanor. And the reality is that every action of selfishness, every action of what we call Kabbalistically, the desire to receive for the self alone, certainly any action that we do that hurts another person, that every single one of those makes it that much more difficult for us to be happy. Because happiness is not an effect of external stimuli, it is an effect of an internal being. And the internal state that we are in is completely dependent on our actions, on our behavior. So it's almost can be said that it's not so much the, the, the problem, is not that we don't pursue happiness enough, it's that we allow ourselves to be in a state that does not allow for happiness. And this is a very big spiritual concept, but it's very important, again, I think for all of us to be thinking about. You know, the reason not to be selfish, the reason not to do harm to other people, the reason not to act in, in egotistical ways is not because I want to be a good person or a spiritual person. It is simply because to the degree that I am allowing myself to behave in those ways, I am not enabling myself to be happy. And therefore, if you take happiness as, as I think most people view it as an external function, what's going to happen to me, or what can I make happen that will make me happy, that's the wrong way to go about it. The right view is, who can I be, or what state can I be in that will allow me to be happy? Right, so exactly. So to get to the state that you want, right? Because we're talking about it's our actions that what we pursue that makes us happy. It has to start with the thought. And I think that the way I would answer the question is what gets people stuck is that they think that they, they had a belief that certain things would make them happy, right? They had an idea of what their life should look like. And I'm supposed to have this kind of life and I'm supposed to have this by this age. And when those things don't happen, when you've decided that they should, then it's cause for sadness, right? So we just put pressure and emphasis in the wrong areas of what we think should make us happy. And our thoughts about it are all wrong. That, that's absolutely true. I'll just underscore what I said, which I think is so important, is that the right way to pursue happiness is with the understanding that there is nothing external that can be the basis of my happiness. And that any unhappiness that I experience has only one cause. And that is where I am at, the being that I am. And the being that I am is an effect of all my actions from the day I was born till today. And the way then to cure unhappiness or the way to pursue happiness is by changing who we are, or at least bettering who we are, therefore enabling us to experience happiness. Because happiness is, is, is an effect of an ex internal state rather than any external occurrence. Right. So first we have to wipe out all the things we thought life should give us or all the things we should have and how it should be and what we're owed and why it isn't and stop looking at other things and really start from that place, a clean slate. And from that place, decide the consciousness you want to go about being happy every day. Remember I met with a couple, well, the wife years ago, and she was so unhappy in her marriage and I was trying to break it down with her, like, what is the cause? What's behind it? And it just wasn't the relationship or the marriage she thought she'd have. It wasn't even that she was necessarily unhappy in her relationship. It just didn't match what she thought she would have. And therefore, she couldn't be happy with what was. So I think the first step in really finding happiness is being curious. So curiosity is tied in to our inherent seeking nature, right? By nature, we are all seekers. Over the past 60 years, scientists and researchers have identified seven primary fundamental emotions, and they're also called the seven ancient emotions. So they are seeking, rage, fear, lust, care, panic and grief are in the same boat, and play. Those seven, again, seeking, rage, fear, lust, care, panic, grief, and play. Neuroscientist and, psych and psychologist Jack Panseep found that he did a bunch of research and he found that negative emotions like panic and grief, when they're experienced, it actually shuts down our seeking system. And when we don't seek, we're not happy, right? So in essence, it causes depression. So he did a ton of research with rats and whatnot. Um, 
And he identified the part of the brain that lights up when they're seeking. It it makes them curious. It, it makes them go and, and search different things. So he took a bunch of college students and put them in a room. And they were left waiting to be seen. And there were these pens that were left over from the group that was there before them. There were green pens, red pens, and yellow pens. And they said it like, oh, these were just left over. So they knew that if they fidgeted with them or they played with them, nobody was really watching them. So they were free to, to explore. So the red pens, the green pens were innocuous. The red pens would deliver an electric shock of 60 volts if they clicked it. And it was painful, but not- To themselves? To themselves. Oh, so they were- they were okay. playing with it. Okay. Um, it wasn't dangerous. And some yellow pens that could deliver the shock or not. It was 50-50. So guess which ones that they all clicked the most? The red? No, the yellow. <laughs> because they were curious of oh, when, when, and how. when will this click? What, what, what is, they were just curious about it. So what he discovered is that we'll put ourselves. <laughs> I they kept on clicking. <laughs> Shot. What he discovered? I is, wouldn't be touching any of the pens I know, after the I, first shot. I, well, <laughs> I'd probably click it on you. Um, <laughs> but what he found is that even when we put ourselves in danger, right, and we know that there could be a perceived danger, we'll do it because we're curious. It's that seeking system that we go after, which is really interesting to know because it tells us a lot about ourselves and what we pursue. And as we grow older, we that instinct to explore and to experience new things and to be curious kind of dies down. We stop asking questions because we might look stupid. We are putting our, we stop putting ourselves in positions where we might get feedback that looks like criticism. And we tend to dismiss that, that curiosity we had as a child. And I remember years ago, we were in um, Hawaii, in Waikiki to be specific, and, uh, and I was running. And I was very, every day I would try a different route because I was so curious about where I could go. And really, whenever we travel, I love running because that's how you really find the place. You get to learn about it. It satiates my curiosity about where we're at because we're not going to have time to go sightseeing. Whatever. So I would go run. And each day I'd pick a different path. And I remember one specific day, I'm running on the beach and there was a surfing competition. So I needed to go out onto the street because there were too many people and it was blocked. So I started running in the pavement and um, I saw a bunch of local runners and they looked like they, they knew where they were going. And I was curious about it. So I followed them. So I'm running in the same direction as them. And before you know it, I'm at the base of Diamond Head, which is a, 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 a volcano that's known there. It's been dormant for 150,000 years. And I'm at the peak of it. And it, you can't miss it because it looks like the, the fin of a dolphin, like a, a tuna. And when I got there, I was in such awe. And I was thinking like, oh, was it just that it was a coincidence that I followed these runners. But no, in fact, it was my curiosity. And it made me recall that in life, all the things that I have found, especially that were most challenging or that I didn't know the outcome, it was my curious nature that allowed me to propel forward. And ultimately, I found happiness in that. And days before that run, I remember we were in the hotel room and I was looking at this volcano in the way distance. And I'm thinking, oh, I'd love to go there. I'd have to get a helicopter. It'd be so hard to find it. And before you knew it, a few days later, I found it, right? Because I was curious about it. So that idea of seeking is so important. But we have to make sure we're seeking the right things because that's where we get really tripped up. We seek things that we really shouldn't or we think will make us happy. And we get tricked because our nature is to seek. It is what lights us up. It is what makes us happy. And I'll, I'll, I'll take that just a little bit uh, um maybe deeper to the spiritual side, which is <clears throat> the reason why seeking is probably the most fundamental aspect of our nature is because the understanding is, and this I want everybody here, every one of our listeners to know, that every single one of us can and is meant to live a life where most of the time, most of the time, we are completely happy. That is, you know, it's not beyond our Most reach. Most people hear that and they're like, that's just not. But it's absolutely the purpose for which our soul came into this world. But as we said before, the foundational drive must be internal. Yes, external things can add to our happiness, but they cannot be the foundation of it. And, that, and we spoke about this a little bit earlier. And that also leads to the understanding about why seeking is so fundamental to what we are. Because being in tune 
with what we call our soul, our essence, the external way of that can be called the, the light of the creator, that force that brought this world into being, being in tune with that energy, with what we call the light of the creator, being in tune with our soul, which is the same energy and idea, that is what makes us happy. And the reason anytime we're unhappy is because we're not in line, we're not living in line with our true essence, with our soul. And the seeking mechanism with which our nature is so pervasive is so that we seek ourselves, meaning understand what we are, who we are, what our soul is, and therefore live a life that is in tune with the soul. Let me just give a simple example. Many of us know what the ego is. The ego is that desire or thought that then leads to actions of how and in what ways people think about me perceive me. I need them to think of me in a certain way, in, in a way that's good. And if in any way something happens that makes me embarrassed, or something that happens that makes me, in my mind, think that other people think of me in, of a, lesser, in a lesser way, that makes me unhappy. That also makes us pursue the wrong things. If I have a lot of money, people will like me. If I have a really strong career and I have a name for myself, it's all of those things that we chase to feed the ego aspect of ourselves. And the reason why that's a big problem is because then we are not living in tune and in line with what we actually are with our soul. Because our soul- We can't even hear it if you're in that realm. Our soul does not care what anybody else thinks. As a matter of fact, the soul couldn't care less about anything that's happening external. But when we live our lives, to, and to whatever extent, we live our lives caring about what others are thinking about us, meaning that type of ego-driven life, that is taking us away from ourselves, taking us away from our essence, and therefore we are incapable of being happy. Because any life that is lived outside of our essence, which unfortunately, if we think about it, and I do think it's important to think about it, how often in a day we think, act, live in ways that are external, all that keeps us away from happiness. And here's the thing, it starts with each and every day. Jonathan Swift penned, may you live every day of your life. And if you really think about that, every time I hear that, it stops me in my tracks because you have to actually think, well, how did I fully live this day? How did I experience this day? And most people go through life and it's just reacting to this or pursuing again, the wrong things. But what, what consciousness did you wake up in today? What was your predominant, your predominant thought? What was the emotion that led that thought? Was it, oh, I have to do X, Y, and Z because that's what they expect, or I have to do this chore, or I'm supposed to do this or that, or is it really something that comes from a deeper space of I really want to experience life in this way? You will never find happiness. It will always be out of your reach if you don't fully live each and every day from the space of your truest self, from that part of you that really can drown out all that noise that's not real, that's not really important, that these, and by the way, the trick is that same noise, right? That same value you place on being liked or being approved, the players are going to change, right? We had a different person in the fifth grade we cared about, and then somebody in high school or in university, and then in our job, and, and then it keeps going. It's not about the person, it's not about the situation, it's about how much emphasis and weight you place on the wrong things. As a matter of fact, I would say that even, I think that's such an important point, any emphasis that we place external, meaning again, how we are viewed, how we are seen, what people are saying, thinking about us, that not only takes us away from our essence, it is absolutely making us unable to be happy. It's not just that it's not a good thing, it's the wrong thing, it's not living the essence of who we are, but it actually steals our happiness. And I think if we were more able to, to tie those two ideas, which means, again, that external pursuit, pursuit of certainly of other people's view of me, all that, not only is it, again, I would say not spiritual, not living within the true essence of my soul, but it actually makes me incapable of being happy. Yeah, I don't know if you do this. I don't think you need to do this because you, you have a different set point than I do. But at the end of every day, I, I evaluate the day. And then I say to myself, was there anything that I did today that I, that I didn't need to do or that I didn't enjoy doing or that wasn't purposeful or didn't make me happy or didn't make me bring happiness to somebody else? I do this every single night. 
or the next morning and I actually edit myself. And so I don't make those same choices the next day or at, I really use it as information that I need to make sure that I keep listening to my soul's desire and purpose. And it's our responsibility to make sure we stay the course. It's not going to happen any other way. No, absolutely. And it reminds me, there's a, there's a great book, which we've quoted in, in the different podcasts, but it's really a beautiful book. And I do strongly recommend everybody to read it. It's called The Five Regrets of the uh, Dying. Uh, 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 Are you going to talk uh, about it? I Should sure I not? am. Okay, so I'll, well, why don't you share first and then I'll share. <laughs> no, that's my conclusion. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> can I share it now and then you can repeat it? No. I think it's important no, for people to hear something it, two no, or three it's times. it's okay. Skip next. Edit. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say, what I, what, so what I would say. Um, oh, you knew what, that I was, because you heard me say this in London, by the way. <laughs> So, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll go over that. I know, I'll be I'll your views. That. Okay, next. But what, what I would say is that, is that I would, what you do at the end of the day, and I would recommend for all of our, everybody here and all of our of listeners, days. <laughs> <laughs> to do it before, right? I think too often in life, we, we're doing, 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 rather than first asking ourselves the question, as you said, is this something that will make me happy? More importantly, is, are these actions, are these behaviors in tune with my essence? Or is it any type of external seeking? Because that I know is not going to make me happy. And why would I be involved in anything? Why would I give any mind share or, or action towards something that is not in tune with my essence, with my soul? Especially since I know it won't be able to bring me any type of happiness. As a matter of fact, it'll be stealing from my happiness. But you know why we do it. Because it's easier to be distracted and to chase something that looks shiny and brilliant and it's an illusion than to do the hard work of actually cultivating and creating your own joy every day. That is hard work. That is hard work for most people, especially if you didn't have models growing up of what happiness looked like. You know, I, I often joke about this, but it's true. I mean, I'm Middle Eastern. We, I come from a long line of sufferers. You know, it was just like, oh my God. You know, it was like very intense all the time. And I was like, what's so bad? What's happening here? Should I be scared? Should I be alarmed? And then finally I was like, okay, I'm changing this for me, right? But I think everybody comes into the world in different ways and in different environments and different circumstances. And getting your happy on is is work at first. And then that becomes your new normal. But it's not, it's not that automatic. But I would add that I think, unfortunately, it's not simply that we're pursuing external because that's easier. I think we also don't have clarity, which I hope we're able to express through this podcast, of what actually is the only thing, the only pursuit that can actually, I don't want to use the word guarantee, but certainly bring us to a state of greater happiness. And, and when we are internally focused, when we are more in tune and listening to our essence, our soul, that is the only path that can lead us towards happiness. So I think it's not just, again, the lack of, of desire to do the hard work because we would like to, to run after the shiny external objects. I think it's also the fact that we have to train ourselves to I like know. I said shiny, you never use that word. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that we train ourselves to know that first, as we said, yes, I am meant to be, if not 100% happy, 100% of the time, very close to that. But that the only way that that's possible is by delving further inside, understanding who I am, what I am, what my soul truly desires to do and try to limit any other thoughts, actions that are external to that. By the way, the example I gave earlier is if you have your day of like, I should do this, or I'm supposed to do that, or I have to do this, you're not going to be happy. The, the, the replacement thought is really, uh, in this moment, I'm doing exactly what, I want, what I'm meant to be doing. I'm feeling happy and purposeful. That's, that really should be the feeling that you have each and every day. So I want to take this other idea of arrival fallacy. It means that happiness... Um, I'll be happy when, or I'll be happy if, right? We all have those moments when I have this much in the bank or when I find my soulmate or when, you know, people like me, whatever it is, it's, um, it's a term given to the illusion of once we make it, once we attain our goal, reach our destination, we'll have lasting happiness. And happiness is never a destination and it can never be something that is meant to be saved. It's kind of like, how Americans go about vacation or retirement. You know, Europeans live very differently. It's, it's you know, it's, like we close four to six or to eight, and then you open that in the summer at nights again, and you take a nap in the day, and you really are able to live each and every day fully. And we don't do that enough. We say, okay, you know, I'm going to work really hard now. I'm going to try to do all these things, and then I'll be happy when this and that happens. Um, 
there's a book called Happier. Tal Ben Shair wrote that. And he wrote about how, you know, he was for five years, he worked towards a championship in um, Israeli squash. And he was miserable. For, is that what it is? Squash. <laughs> It's squash. He was miserable. Yes, it is squash. It's you looked at me. You, it is a vegetable. You looked at me <laughs> no, like, no. but I was right. Okay, yeah, thanks but... for making me doubt myself. Um, so he worked for five years and he was miserable in those five years. And he said, I'll be happy when I win the championship. So he won and he was happy. He went out and celebrated. And guess what? Five hours into the celebration, he went back to the place of sadness. And he realized that happiness can never be goal-oriented. How many of us have that? It's, I have this goal, and when I achieve it, then I'm going to be happy. And the truth is, it's that process in the middle that's messy, that's, that's unpredictable, that's a little bit painful, that's unknown. If you can really learn to embrace and love those moments and find your happy in it, because what's happening in those moments, your soul is stretching, you're transforming in those moments. If you understand the purpose of the process and from that place, you actually are able to live a happy life. It can never, ever be something. And I, I know this firsthand. We all, I think many people know this, but we have to fully embrace that. It can never be goal oriented. Yeah. The only thing I would add to that is that it's often goal oriented, which is the thought that if and when I reach that, then I'll be happy. The other big thief of happiness is when the individual says, you know, I'd be happy, but this is happening. Oh yeah. Right. I'd be happy, but I have this problem. Yeah. And that is one of the biggest thieves of, of happiness. And, you know, I'll, I'll share often what I'll do because all of a us personal have... personal story? A, well, it's kind of personal. Deeply uh, personal. It's not deeply personal. It's just personal. Maybe I'll uh, add some <laughs> little parts that make it deeply personal. So, so because I think, I think for most of us, especially those of us who are truly desiring to, to pursue true happiness, what happens is in life, every one of us has certain things. In a given day, there'll be three or four to five things that can make you unhappy, that can make you stressed. And one of the tools that I use, because I think it's important to realize, because that thought, oh, I'll be happy when this problem goes Babe, away. Babe, let's be honest, you yeah. wake up happy. Yes, okay. that's true, that's true. But sometimes, sometimes there are things that happen. Um, and certainly to our <laughs> listeners. <laughs> so so whenever, whenever something happens, <laughs> whenever something happens that has the potential to be either stressful or, or possibly stealing any type of, of happiness, and this, this is kind of an extreme story, but, but it really works for me. And I, and I, and I uh, believe some form of this will work for all of us. So there's a great Kabbalist who lived during the time of the Second World War. He was, uh, his name is, we both uh, love his writings. His name is Klonimus Kalmash of Piasetsna. And he lived, again, in the Warsaw Ghetto, and he was eventually killed uh, in, in the Warsaw Ghetto. And one of the stories, and it's a crazy story, that there's one of the days of connection holidays. It's called Simchat Torah. It's a day when you're supposed to dance and be happy. And on the eve of that holiday, there was a bombing of the Warsaw Ghetto, and his daughter and, and son-in-law were killed. And, of course, everybody expected that the festivities would be canceled, that, that he wouldn't even come to the, to the celebration. But crazy, as it might seem, he came down, he was filled with joy, and he danced. Now, of course, he was a very elevated soul, and of course, none of us are expected to experience that type of pain, and in the next few hours, have the joy. But for me, what I take from that story is that anytime I say, well, I'd be happy, but this stressful thing is happening, I say to myself, is it in any way on the same level as that? Chas v'shalom, as we say? Of course not. Then... Of course, if he could be happy after that terrible calamity, of course, I can be happy now. And one of the things, and I've shared this, but I think for me it has been so powerful, as many of our, of course, our friends here and our listeners know, my mother left this physical world um, just about over a year, a year and a few months ago. And one of the great, I, I, I learned many, many lessons uh, from her, for, certainly throughout her life, but certainly in the last year. And one of the greatest ones, and you and I have spoken about this, um, between the two of us, that there were so many things that prior to that, you know, you worry about, you're upset about, then you realize, again, and my mother would often use the phrase, in the final analysis, 99% of the things that upset us, 
that steal our happiness from today, that fall into the category of, oh, I'd be happy, but this is happening, completely unimportant. Completely unimportant. So for me, I think one of the great tools to use when we're in a state of, yeah, I'd like to be happy, but this is happening, or I'd like to be happy, but this stressful situation exists, really, but this takes training, this is not going to happen in a day, but to remind ourselves, in the, in the truest sense of what is important, how important is this? In the final analysis, is this, is this even worth mentioning? And usually, usually the answer is no. And therefore, how, how, how will I even allow it to steal one second of my joy? But again, that takes work. I think it takes practice and work to get to that state. And of course, it's, you know, it's, it's a continuum of growing in that. But I think it's important for all of us to make that a goal. And really a question that we ask ourselves. What happens today that I am not strong enough to not allow it to steal from my happiness? And how do I grow and develop myself into such a state, practice, where that will no longer steal my happiness? So that next year, if that same thing happened, it'll be not even a thought. Of course I'm happy, even though this is also going on in the background. I think before building that strength, we have to understand that we are all under an illusion, the veil of illusion. So if you don't even realize that that's what's happening day to day, you're, you're not, it's, it's not a strength that you can even access because you don't recognize it, right? Rav Ashlag said that the difference between somebody who is tremendously fulfilled and somebody who's unfulfilled is their ability to see. And when we, when we understand something, we say, I see, right? It's not something that's actually changed. We just understand it in a different way. And I think that everybody has those moments where illusion takes over them and causes them to take the wrong things too seriously. And I... And I would say, unfortunately, we live in that world much more often than not. Oh, 90, like 99% of the time we live in that world. And the the most powerful example, and again, I'm, I'm grateful for it now, of course, not at the time, where I, I realized what an illusion we can be under and how seriously we can take ourselves is when I had anorexia for five years and um, from when I was 17. And I remember that, and I just met with a little girl that I can't get out of my mind, um, who's nine. And uh, I met with her this week and she's anorexic. And it was a very, very painful meeting for me because she was explaining my experience at the time, but in a nine-year-old's vocabulary and voice. But anyway, at that time, you know, and, and this is the conversation I had with her about, you know, do I, you know, as she said, I, I, I look, I look bigger and that's just what she kept saying. And I'm like, bigger than what? She's like, just bigger. So I remember for you, you know, for years, I saw myself a certain way when I would look in the mirror. And then one day, one day, for whatever reason, I'm looking in the mirror and I'm doing my daily pinch test, which was taking my two fingers and pinching what was not there and thinking that skin was a lot of fat. And one day I saw myself as I really was and I was horrified. I could not believe by my own hands I had created this skeleton, skeletal version of myself. Like when did that happen and how did I do that? And I started screaming and crying to my mother. I was I was just mortified. I was shocked. And I knew in that moment that I the veil would come back. I knew it but I knew now that I couldn't lie to myself. So no matter what my eyes saw, no, what, no matter what felt real to me, I knew it was an illusion that was stronger than anything, but now I knew. And that experience for me has helped me throughout my life because no matter what illusions have come over me, I'm always like, Monica, remember that time you looked in the mirror? And it's guided me through life. And I don't think people probably have such an extreme, crazy, and I, I hope they don't, experience, but we all have those moments where we are so fooled by what we think is important or by what we see, and it's the opposite, and it's just set up as a roadblock for us, meant for us to kick it over and say, no, there's something greater and bigger than this. And that's where it starts with the work that you were saying. The veil needs to, you have to first know that that is the realm that we're living in. Right, I think it's so important. I think what I would ask everybody here and every one of our listeners to ask themselves the question, well, go back a week, a day, a month, a year, what was the thing that was so important to you at a certain time? 
And in retrospect, it's not only it's like not life important, or death at that maybe time. life or death are so important. This has upset the whole, my whole life. And in retrospect, it's not only not that important, it's zero, zero of importance. And, and I think that's when we talk about the training, I think part of it is moving forward by saying, will I allow this stress, this situation to steal my happiness from today? And part of that is, is the daily training of that question. But the other is to look back and say, well, hey, you remember three years ago, this thing happened and you were so upset, so worried about it. And it, it meant the whole world. And now it is completely insignificant. And every one of us has that, has a hundred of those, right? I mean, all the things can you imagine when you were in kindergarten, when you were in high school, when you were in college, when you were 20 years old, but however old you are, there were always those things. Oh my God, this is, oh my, I can't believe this is happening. This is so terrible. My life is ruined well, or whatever. in kindergarten, things felt pretty tragic. I mean, really? Yeah. I mean, I can give you a few stories. I don't remember anything tragic from kindergarten. <laughs> you don't remember kindergarten. Do you remember kindergarten? I do actually. I have a few memories. But the point is, <laughs> wait, you have some tragic stories in kindergarten? Yeah, this girl bit my, my shoulder because I slept on the cot that she wanted by the toys. <laughs> yeah, I was traumatized. Yeah, I remember it. Uh, I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but, but the point is, all of us have, can look back at our lives and remember those situations and remember how insignificant now, and know now how insignificant they were. And therefore, as we move forward in life, Oh, well, that one was pretty significant. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to sleep on my cot. Yeah, I remember that. She bit me hard. I bled. <laughs> she bled. Yeah, she, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but the point is, if, as the more of those situations that we can bring to front of mind, the more we can actually not allow the new situations, which seem so big to us in the moment, to steal from our happiness. And this is the crazy thing. Another story is I'm all about personal stories. You're not so much, but... <laughs> Um, my, you know, we, we, I was raised in New Orleans, born in Thibodeau and, uh, and my father had, you know, a lot of wealth. We had a lot of happiness then. I remember my childhood and I went back, um, eight years or 10 years after we moved and it was like everything in our face again. And I was looking at the neighborhood and the, the swings on the porches and just, I was like, this was just, it was, we were happy here. I was happy. My family was happy. And, but they thought they'd be happier. They thought they could take all that happiness that they had, they had created, his business, his family, their, everything, and take it to Los Angeles, to Beverly Hills. And it would, it would be all of that, but then all these other things that they thought would make them even happier. So what happened? They moved. We lost everything. And they were miserable for years. I don't remember anything for eight years when we moved. And in reality, right, they were chasing happiness, but they had it all along. But they thought that it could be a different way, a better way or something. It was like their family that was there was living a different life and they could have all of that too, only in that they had it all along. Yeah, And, and, that, that, and that's that, the thing in seeking the wrong things again. Because and also leads to the idea that, and this is again, science backs this up 100%, that, that one of the great reasons that we lack in happiness is our lack of appreciation of our current situation. And it reminds me, you know, um, I was just watching the news and of course we're all aware of what's happening now in, in, in Ukraine. And I was watching an interview with, with a woman who uh, was with her, with, with her children in Kiev. And she was saying, you know, last week, you know, I didn't appreciate a clear sky, I mean, a clear sky without bombs. And today, and she was crying and she was saying, please, if you have a clear sky, appreciate it. Mm. And I think the understanding that one of the greatest ways to achieve happiness is not certainly by attaining the next thing, but by having greater appreciation for what we currently have. And every single one of us, every single one of us has enough in our lives right now that if appreciated enough can bring us great happiness. But because for so many reasons, we know it's part of really life's work, we're going for the next thing that's going to bring us even greater happiness, like in your story, rather than saying, what can I do today? The Kabbalists say that there should be a hundred times a day that you awaken appreciation, not for what you hope will come, but for what you currently have. And to the degree, some people say it should be a thousand times a day, really ask yourselves the question, how many times today I'll share with you a simple story here, a personal deep story. story. So at uh, at 3.30 today, our, door, our youngest yeah, daughter... It's not going to be deep okay. at all. 
<laughs> Abigail, our youngest daughter, came home, and I just heard her coming through the door, and I stopped everything. By the way, when she comes home, she almost never comes and hugs me. She always goes to cut the <laughs> hug, Monica. It's kind of the joke in our house. But the point is, when she came in the house, that second, I stopped everything. I was working. I stopped everything and literally took about 20, 30 seconds just to appreciate that moment. And I think, unless, and I think, I know this for a fact, that unless we are having a hundred to a thousand moments of appreciation for what we currently have in a day, we will never achieve the highest level of happiness that we can and are meant to have. So it's important to, to underscore the fact that one of the greatest ways to achieve greater happiness is by awakening greater appreciation for the current blessings that we have in our lives, rather than simply looking for the next thing, as you said, that's going to bring us happiness, or the next place that will bring us happiness. Well, here's the thing. Appreciation is the key to long-term happiness. But I think that, again, you, you go to the chipper happy place of, we need to appreciate the blue skies. Of course, all those things, a child laughing, your children, whatever that is. But appreciation is also to be able to access that level of consciousness when things are challenging and difficult because our purpose in this world and why we came here is to transform that that change that must occur that transformation that must happen often happens through difficulty and struggles and it's to be able to appreciate those moments especially and not feel bad about them not let it be sadness that stays longer than it should i mean sadness is an emotion we all have and it's necessary but it should be a visitor it shouldn't be something that camps out forever right so it reminds me of the story of the um rick allen he was in the band deaf leopard any fans not so popular kind of yes -ish. nobody over there wow one okay two God, you got me to turn around i, I see you guys so it's a really interesting story I found very inspiring. He was driving um, his Corvette on a, a windy road in England very fast. He tried to bypass another car. He lost control of, of his own car because he was going very fast, and he hit a stone wall. He was wearing a seatbelt, but the seatbelt um, propelled him through the windshield and held onto his arm, and it severed his arm in the accident. And he's with his girlfriend. They both survived, but he lost his arm. Now, he was the drummer of Def Leppard, and they were just starting their fame at that time. And so any person would be hopeless, feel helpless. Why, at the beginning of my stardom and my fame, why would this happen that he lost an arm? Most people would give up, right? Forget about appreciation. Forget about happiness. Forget about purpose, transformation, change. But what did he do? He learned how to play the parts that he would play the drum with the arm that he lost with his feet. There was nothing, there, a one-arm drummer did not exist ever at that time. And he learned how to play, and guess what? He was a better drummer than he was with his two arms. And it's such an inspirational story because it's having appreciation in those moments where, as you said at the beginning, what are the reasons? There's sadness, there's, you know, we assign our misery to all kinds of things, but it's really up to us to awaken appreciation in the darkest times, in times where we let your curiosity, what could you do if you allowed yourself to actually explore that? I think, as you said, uh, sadness, if not for sadness, we would not appreciate happiness. Yeah. So certainly there are the, the, the right moments, the, the moments that, that are meant to be sad, but like you said, as a visitor, visitor. right, not as a permanent resident. And the understanding being that hopefully this sadness is necessary and that this sadness will bring me to a greater appreciation of her life with, without sadness. So I have... Do I wanna, still have my, oh. my book after, but oh. you, read your, you read your... So I wanted to share with, exactly to this point. There's a, there's a beautiful um, uh, Irish poem, poet that I really like and I've, I shared uh, another, another idea of his when we were in London. But um, it's a little bit long, but bear with me. I really think it's beautiful. It really speaks to this idea of, of those moments in life that there is sadness, and both appreciating them and then, and then elevating out of them. So, uh, again, I do recommend, he has a number of books. He, unfortunately, he's passed away at a very young age. His name is John O'Donoghue. When the rhythm of the heart becomes hectic, time takes on the strain until it breaks. Then all the unattended stress falls in on the mind like an endless increasing weight. The light in the mind becomes dim 
things you could take in your stride before now become laborsome events of will. Weariness invades your spirit. Gravity begins falling inside you, dragging down every bone. The tide you never valued has gone out, and you are marooned on unsure ground. Something within you has closed down, and you cannot push yourself back to life. You have been forced to enter empty time. The desire that drove you has relinquished. There is nothing else to do now but rest. And patiently learn to receive the self you have forsaken in the race of days. At first your thinking will darken, and sadness take over like listless weather. The flow of unwept tears will frighten you. You have traveled too fast over false ground. Now your soul has come to take you back. Take refuge in your senses, open up to all the small miracles you rushed through. Become inclined to watch the way of rain when it falls slow and free. Imitate the habit of twilight, taking time to open the well of color that fostered the brightness of day. Draw alongside the silence of stone until its calmness can calm you. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Stay clear of those vexed in spirit. Learn to linger around someone of ease who feels they have all the time in the world. Gradually, you will return to yourself, having learned a new respect for your heart and the joy that dwells far within slow time. It's a little sad. But I think, yes, sad I like the part well. of be gentle with yourself. Yes, and I, my favorite part is the idea of both being gentle with yourself, but also to the people you surround yourself with. So, be happy now, live a life with no regrets. Too often people say, I wish I go back to my childhood, I would have done things differently. I wouldn't have been in such a rush to grow up. I would have taken time to appreciate things. People often, and it's a vicious, vicious cycle because 10 years from now, if you have those thoughts over and over again, you're going to wish that you were present in this day today or tomorrow. People in their 30s often idolize their teenage years. People in their 50s fixate on their 30s. And it's it's a never-ending pursuit. So it's really something to be aware of and be mindful of so you can be present fully in this day each and every day. And really, I mean, take time, all of us right now in this moment, what, what today felt like a gift to you? Where could you really just focus on where you felt happy for a moment and let that be the predominant thought and feeling and emotion and forget all the other noise, all the negativity. Somebody said something to you you didn't like, or they looked at you a way that you made, made you feel insecure. Just let it go. None of that matters. And to really make that point, um, as Mikhail tried to reference earlier, Bronnie Ware's <laughs> book, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. She was a hospice nurse and she has seen many people through their deaths and she wrote a blog about it and then she wrote a book about it and she is really a phenomenal um she's a, a great perspective just from her experience so what she found is that and what i love about it, it's kind of like our crystal ball she really every single person that she helped through this transition from life to afterlife they all had the same top five regrets and this is what they were one is, I wish I had had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected me to live. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I had had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. Number five, I wish I would have let myself be happier. And say it again, Just listen to the words. I wish I would have let myself be happier. So the conclusion is, let yourself be happy. Happiness is not the end result. It's a tool we can use in the here and now to alleviate any darkness and reveal the light within our blessings in its fullest capacity. And I met with somebody, I was counseling a couple this week, and she was very serious and he kept laughing. And his laughter upset her because she was in a lot of pain. And I'm, I'm watching them thinking, he's not laughing at you and he's not laughing because he's not also in pain. He's laughing because he's trying to elevate the experience of it all. He's trying to grow from it. He's trying to find purpose and meaning from this difficult situation. So 
So it's actually kind of inspiring. Yeah, I think, and again, I do recommend uh, every everybody reading that book because unfortunately we too often lose perspective. And, and we only gain it in the last week. Well, usually. well, hopefully not, like, right? Hopefully. No, <laughs> hopefully. for most people, right, it's right. not, that's why they're the regrets. And that's why we're talking about it. And the fact, I think most of us don't realize that we can choose happiness. We are waiting for it to happen. We are waiting to experience it. But that powerful message that too often we do not allow ourselves to experience happiness because of all kinds of other, in retrospect, silly reasons. And remember, happiness is not something you chase. It's something you choose. Absolutely. Each and every moment. Absolutely. So I think... But you did say something recently. When did you say this? About when people usually wake up at the end of their... When did you say that? I think when we were in London. Do you remember? That what... They wake up like at the end, like a week before. Right, right. Actually, this is, also, they, they, yeah, this is another quote from John O'Donoghue. John O'Donoghue is a very interesting story. I do recommend his books, his, his books of poems and blessings. But one of that, one of the, he, he, at one point, he was a, he was a priest. He left the priesthood to become a poet, which is interesting. But when he was a priest, he used to um, uh, spend the last weeks with people in this world. And one of the things he noticed was that even people who were brash, harsh, not choosing happiness in life, in the last week of their lives, they became soft and open and vulnerable. And he said what he realized is that they realized that so many of the choices that they made and the sh hard shell that they created around them will not take them through this process. Right. And, and, and they had to lean into softness and, they had to and become something else they realized to get through the, the last week of their lives. Exactly, or the last phase of their lives. And of course, the lesson for all of us who have an endless amount of, of years left is don't get to that state where only towards the end do you realize first you can choose life. Second, those harsh walls that we build around us don't really bring us happiness. And at the end, they have to go anyway. Why don't we let go of them much, much, much earlier. So I kind of feel like, so this is, this talk today was about being happier. And I think we kind of made it like heavy and a little bit on sadness and death, but I think that needs to be the motivator to really just like shake yourself up and wake up to just choose happiness every day. Cause if not, what's, what's going to actually make you pause right now and say, okay, I'm not, I'm not, do, I'm not going to live my life in this realm of illusions every day. You have to be a little bit yeah, you have to wake because, up, because you know, like you have to be a little before, scared. I, really, I mean, it feels true. heavy, but I think it's important. That we all experience, one of the greatest thieves of our happiness is the fact that we allow ourselves to take too seriously, give too much importance to the current Stupidity. stressful, whatever, silly thing in retrospect, in the final analysis. And, and, and if we make it a point, if we are adamant not to allow the things that are not truly important, to steal my happiness today, we will absolutely live a happier life. So as we always say, first of all, thank you. you thank you to say. as I always say, thank you to all of our friends here in New York. Thank you to all of our friends streaming. Thank you to all of our friends who will be listening to this podcast. Please make sure to send any comments, questions to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. We often answer the questions on the podcast. We build our podcast based on so much of the feedback that we receive. Share your inspirational stories. And as always, I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it. Stay spiritually hungry. Woo. Thank Bye. you.